Um, great. Thank you, Tristan. Um, so yeah, our first session, as, as Tristan so nicely put up, is going to focus on the first of those three things that uh, Tristan was talking about there, three parts of the puzzle, as he said. Um, so this first session is going to look at um, what we've learned from COVID, so um, in the role that schools play in community transmission. So I'd uh, like to uh, welcome our first speaker, uh, James Mundy from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, SHTM. Um, so uh, James, I believe, is going to talk to us about um, work looking at uh, using community data to evaluate the potential wide impact of school-based SARS-CoV-2 transmission. So lessons that we've learned and reflections on that. And um, uh, yeah, if people have questions, as Jane said at the beginning, feel free to put those in the chat or uh, raise a hand at the end. And I think we'll take all questions at the end of the talk. Um, so with that, I'll pass over to you, James. Thank you. Um so much, uh, Kira, and thank you, Tristan and Jane, as well, for um, organising this event. I think it's a really important topic and great to see a really broad um, approach uh, to um, to it. Um, and also such a pleasure to speak along such, uh, alongside such distinguished um, colleagues. Um, so thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I wanted to present some reflections um, on some work that we did um, earlier in the pandemic. Um, on using kind of data-driven approaches to understand um, particularly the impact of reopening schools after lockdown. So that's the context of the work, but obviously it kind of pertains to the, con the impact, the potential impact of transmission within schools, and then the kind of, um, uh, the, particularly the impact on the, on the community as that transmission um, occurs. Um, so first of all, I'll, I'll kind of open with discussing what I mean by community data. Um, and how I'm tying those together. And then I'm gonna present two pieces of work that we did. Um, the first, uh, using school census data um, to evaluate the wider implications of, of school transmission. And then secondly, um, uh, some, some work we did using um, social contact data. Uh, and then I'll tie up um, the talk by considering kind of thoughts on use of community data in this context and whether um, whether these were uh, successful and, and what we might want to change in the future. Um, so community data, I mean, by, by community data, I'm using kind of a broad definition for data sources that don't directly um, detail epidemiological phenomenon, but they may be used as a proxy to evaluate the potential risk of transmission in, in certain scenarios. So we used um, two uh, commu key community data sets. The first um, is school census data, which is pupil level data for every state school in England, which we, we got from um, with permission from the Department for Education. And then secondly, um, social contact data, uh, which is uh, essentially social contacts of participants collected, um, in this case, using a regular contact survey um, of the UK population. Um, but other examples of, of community data may be uh, mobility data, which detail geographical movement of, um, of individuals in the population, um, or, uh, for example, time use data, uh, which um, is generally generated from surveys similar to, I guess, to contact surveys, but looking at more how time spent. Um, so these data sources don't directly pertain to, uh, to transmission, unlike, for example, contact tr tracing data, um, but we're, we're using them um, to essentially as a proxy to look at the impact of transmission in schools. <clears throat> so just quickly, um, a reminder of what the, uh, what the kind of timeline of the pandemic looked like um, in England. So uh, there were three kind of uh, national lockdown periods. Um, the first starting in March, 2020, the second um, in November and the third uh, in the new year in, in 2021. Uh, um, and uh, during the kind of, over this period, there were also enforced school closures and these broadly aligned with the national lockdown periods um, one and three, whereas the, um, in, uh, in lockdown two, there were no um, school, the schools were remained open, whereas the rest of the population was, um, was restricted to, to stay at home orders. Um, so the first piece of work uh, I'm going to present, we used this, the national schools uh, census data to evaluate the implications of reopening. And we did that at the kind of the ending, the end of lockdown one. So as schools reopened for the first time after they were closed in, um, in March 2020, um, 
And we wanted to look at the potential for large scale transmission facilitated by schools. So rather than just within school transmission, what would happen if, if we assume that transmission is um, going to occur? And then and we compared various reopening scenarios. So um, reopening primary schools, um, reopening secondary schools, all schools, and also um, a scenario reopening just the transition years of schools. Um, and we looked at a range of uh, different within school reproduction numbers between um, 1.1 and 1.5. Um, <clears throat> so school census data, which was um, provided to us from the Department of England, uh, Department for Education, uh, was it includes just over 21,000 um, state funded schools in England uh, and details um, just under 5 million uh, primary school children and uh, 3.5 million, well, 300, around about three and a half million secondary school children. And th they live in kind of collectively in about 5 million, um, uh, 5 million unique addresses. Um, and so this is this is key. So there's kind of obviously some overlap with where these children live. And that's the point. That's how we um, what we wanted to kind of uh, take uh, advantage of. So if you consider a human population as a network, maybe the most natural um, communities to define in the population are households, typically, because they form cliques. We expect everyone in the household to have contact with each other. And then these households are linked together by contacts um, outside uh, in the community. Um, but we're specifically interested in school contacts. So um, it becomes convenient to consider the network rather than a network of households with 5 million nodes, a network of schools with um, 21,000 nodes in this case, um, where household contacts are then incorporated um, in the uh, edges between the schools, the links between the schools. Um, <clears throat> so by identifying groups of students that share households using postcodes, we're able to build a network of schools based on likely contact links through those households. Um, and then the edges in, in this kind of first network here, with the purple network, are the number of unique contact pairs between schools based on the, the household data we have. Um, so then using that network, we can estimate the probability of transmission between schools by making some simple assumptions about final size of outbreaks in schools and transmission within the home. And that, so that network, network B gives us a probability of transmission between schools on each edge. And then thirdly, by sampling these probabilities, we can create binary outbreak networks, which are essentially plain networks um, with uh, kind of binary edges. Um, and these simulated networks uh, give us some information about the um, final size distribution of outbreaks that we'd expect uh, by taking the connected components. So the, connect, uh, the largest component here shown with um, kind of highlighted in blue um, gives the largest outbreak on that network, um, the, the number of schools you expect to be infected uh in 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 that outbreak um so first looking at kind of at the contact network uh degree distributions the degree gives the number of schools connected on the network but the weighted degree gives the number of contacts with other schools so in this plot you can see these kind of degree distributions with primary schools in blue and secondary schools in red and you can immediately see that um both the degree and weighted degree are higher for secondary schools and primary schools um, so this may be partly due to secondary schools being larger, but we also saw evidence that um, within households, it's more likely that multiple secondary schools are, uh, are represented than multiple primary schools. So this may play a part um, in that. Uh, similarly, we look at the, the weighted degree of the transmission network. So the weighted degree um, of a school A, uh, so kind of a particular school A gives um, the expected number of neighboring schools where outbreaks might be seeded in the event that an out, of an outbreak in school A. So it's the sum of the probabilities gives the, the kind of expected number of seeded outbreaks. So again, um, secondary schools uh, here in panel C uh, result in a higher um, average number of seeded outbreaks than, than primary schools, or, and which are very similar to kind of the um, select school years, the, the transition years. And then reopening all years it, um, is, it is higher again. Um, and another thing to note is this kind of very fat tail um, on the, these distributions, which indicates that there's potential for kind of schools that, that could see a very large number of outbreaks. So kind of almost super spreading schools within the network um, if you have outbreaks in those schools. So it's the, this suggests that potentially secondary schools, um, on average, you, uh, if you have an outbreak in secondary schools, you, you're more likely to see rapid spread into the kind of local area um, 
than within primary schools. Um, and then looking at these uh, kind of outbreak size distributions um, using these the con connected components on the, the simulated binary net binary outbreak networks. Um, again, uh, kind of uh, the second part, the first two panels show the transition years and um, prime reopening primary schools and um, in the, for the most part, the final sizes are small, so between kind of one and 600 households in this case. I've uh, translated this back to households. This is the number of households in schools affected, not necessarily the number of households with infections. Um, so you, you have kind of, yeah, between uh, 100 and 600 households affected. Um, but reopening secondary schools um, allows the network to, to, uh, to connect up much more um, easily and as a result you get these very very large outbreaks occurring uh, kind of um, up to kind of 2.5 million households affected which is a large proportion of households represented in secondary schools and then reopening all schools obviously adding more um, connections in the network um, allows an even larger number of households to be connected obviously that you would hope that in interventions would <laughs> other interventions may stop this but th but this is kind of like um, the final size that you might expect if nothing was was done, um, according to this frame, this framework. So there are some really key limitations to this um, work. First of all, it neglects any transmission outside the household, um, outside of school and household populations. Um, it relies on supercritical transmission in schools, which wasn't necessarily clear, I guess, early on um, in the pandemic, but potentially is is um, more clear now, with uh, especially with recent variants. Um, it ignores internal school structure, exactly, for example, classes and year groups, which may affect the, the kind of final, final size of outbreaks. Um, it assumes tr transmission potential is equal in all schools. Um, and, and importantly, that immunity doesn't vary by age or geography, which might be important, you know, as um, immunity is, uh, is gained um, from infection uh, differently in different geographical locations. Um, so it's kind of, yeah limited but it, w i wanted to kind of now reflect on kind of this use we did it quickly as a kind of um in um in a kind of response uh framework um and so it was this useful is it useful and, and when could it be applied so i think it it provides a useful insight into the far-reaching potential of transmission within schools in any context um and particularly highlights the difference between primary and secondary schools when it comes to um, wider transmission and, and how connected they are on, um, on these networks. Um, in the context of the pandemic, there aren't many scenarios where the simplif simplifications we made apply directly. Um, there were a few points in the pandemic when they were more applicable, for example, lockdown two, as I mentioned, where the adult population was largely locked down, but the student population, the um, schools were closed, no, so schools were open, and then, um, and then kind of more recently, as the adult population um, immunity increased uh, with vaccination, but children mostly remained unvaccinated. Um, and then also it's potentially more applicable in scenarios where schools are highly influential in transmission, like, for example, we know for influenza um, and maybe for, for COVID-19 in, in the future, depending on how it um, progresses. Um, so. For the second, uh, the second piece of work I want to present, we used contact data to evaluate the potential of reopening, um, potential increase in transmission from reopening schools in March 2021. Um, so this is kind of in the middle of the third lockdown, um, and we the contact data we used is it was collected as part of the COMIC survey, which is a large. Um, contact survey uh, that's um, conducted in in a total of seventeen countries, but we use the the um, the UK data. Um, the the data includes contacts from the previous twenty four hours of each participant um, and details of, of the contact events, including the age, location, duration of contact, and whether contacts were physical or conversational. Uh, there's actually a load of other information in there which we're not really using um, as well. Uh, in the UK, there are about um, 2,500 adults enrolled, 500 children. Um, data was collected weekly, and um, there are there are around a hundred rounds um, of the survey um, taking you uh, from kind of March 2020 to February 2022. 
Um, so it's a big data set, <laughs> uh, but help, helpfully we've got this kind of time varying contact data so we can look back at the rest of the um, pandemic and kind of use that um, data from different periods to understand how um, the, the, the interventions affected contacts. Um, so one really neat thing about contact um, data is you can construct contact matrices which effectively give the mean number of contacts between age groups. And these can directly inform kind of epidemiological parameters or, or give us information about epidemiological parameters um, via the next generation principle, which is essentially um, so the next generation matrix um, is uh, is defined. So if you multiply the age stratified infections at generation G by the next generation matrix, you get age stratified infections at generation G plus one. Um, and the next generation matrix is essentially an, aug an augmentation of the contact matrices matrix by um, the age specific susceptibility and age specific infectiousness. Um, so a key uh, property of the next generation matrix is at, at transmission equilibrium, the, um, it, the age stratified infectiousness becomes or um, distribution of infectiousness becomes um, an eigenvector wh whose eigenvalues are naught. So the, eigen the eigenvalue of the next generation matrix is the basic reproduction number. So we're using this property um, to kind of link the contact data to um, transmission in the population. Um, so the what we kind of did was we we took advantage of the fact that schools were open during lockdown two, but weren't open during lockdown three, um, and we combined these data to kind of evaluate what the impact of um, based on the current reproduction number, what the impact might be as, as schools reopened under three scenarios. So um, firstly, uh, all schools open and primary schools open and secondary schools open. So for, um, for each uh, scenario, we have a scenario contact matrix. For all schools open, we just use the lockdown two matrix. So that's where um, you know, we, we assume that it's gonna move back to something like what we observed in lockdown two. Um, and then for primary school, schools open and secondary schools open, we modify the matrices. So for primary schools open, we, we um, basically installed the lockdown three contacts of secondary school children because they remain closed. Um, and uh, in, for secondary schools open, we installed the lockdown three contacts for primary school children. So we can kind of combine these two matrices to make um, these scenario matrices. And by taking the eigenvalue of the um, of the contact matrix, which is then augmented by an age specific um, infectiousness and susceptibility. Um, these are relative vectors now, they don't, because, because we're taking the ratio, we can, we can do that. So um, we take the eigenvalue of, of essentially that kind of pseudo next generation matrix and um, that which we're observing in lockdown three. Um, and that gives us the relative increase in reproduction number um, that we'd expect as schools reopen. Um, and what did we find? Well, we found that depending on the assumptions regarding age-specific susceptibility and infectiousness, which we took from different um, published work, and we also used the COMEX data to try and estimate ourselves, um, we found we estimated an increase between kind of 1.3 and 1.6 um, times the reopening uh, times um, increase uh, as we reopen schools. So this is 1.3 to 1.6 times the pre-opening um, reproduction number value. Um, obviously, th th there are some key limitations to this work as well. Uh, we assume that all contacts are the same, uh, critically within schools and, and outside of schools. Um, we assume that changes in R are immediate, uh, but actually, when you wrap, when you change kind of the distribution of contacts by age rapidly, then you you expect kind of a bedding in period where you reach equilibrium, um, which can take a few generations of of infection. Um, we assume that the age distribution of immunity captured was in the estimates, uh, sorry, the age distribution of immunity is captured in the estimates um, of age specific susceptibility. So some of these estimates were quite old and actually as infections are, uh, um, as we get more infections in different age groups, that might change. Uh, we, infu we assume the infection and susceptibility of all children is equal. So primary schools and secondary schools school children have equal susceptibility and infectiousness um, and we assume that both clearly both child and adult contacts reverted to the same as what we observed in lockdown two if schools reopened um, but we this is 
important because we knew there were some changes actually within school um, in terms of within school contacts. Um, it, it was sorry within school restrictions which may affect contacts, um, but we weren't able to implement those. So if we look at how we can actually kind of check how this <laughs> went in terms of comparing to the uh, the estimates of R that um, followed, so uh, R did increase, um, but not initially as much as we anticipated. Um, you can see the the national R estimates. These are the UK national R estimates from um, from the government website uh, weekly. Um, in in these kind of grey blocks, and then the purple and blue panes here show uh, the two of the scenarios using different um, infectious and susceptibility estimates that we uh, we used. Um, so you can see we're, we're kind of over predicting, but there were many other factors affecting reproduction number at the time. So it's actually quite difficult to, to know kind of to really disentangle this um, from our framework. Uh, so I mentioned new school measures. There's also this school holiday which occurred three weeks after schools reopened. Um, these are estimates are, sl are slightly delayed, so um, you'd expect uh, kind of a week or two delay in seeing the change. Um, uh, there were also the green lines here show the removal of other restrictions um, as kind of lockdown was lifted. Um, and then right at the end here, um, we're kind of seeing, starting to see the emergence of Delta, um, which is likely to drastically inc increase R itself. Um, so I think in terms of use and applicability, I think it provides a, you know, at the time it provided a rough estimate of the potential additional contribution of schools um, using the data that was available. Um, it's really difficult to quantify how well that worked, uh, but I think it, 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 uh, it does highlight like the importance of understanding these kind of um, contact data um, a bit better. Uh, especially kind of the nuances of different contacts in different locations. So just to over, sum up overall, um, I think these kind of data-driven approaches give a really, um, their, their key benefit is that they give like a very transparent um, uh, metric in the sense that they allow structured assessment of particular transmission phenomena without combining the kind of data with other modeling assumptions. So it's clear where, where the limitations lie. Um, the, this kind of comes with some problems though. Uh, for example, they really require clear communication because the results are likely to be quite abstract um, and more abstract than traditional modeling results, which may not pertain directly to kind of the reality that you expect. Um, and then uh, thirdly, there's a, a key downside is it's difficult sometimes to, impl to integrate even known additional complications um, as it's difficult as you can't kind of incorporate them without applying judgments of your own um, in in uh, how that might affect the framework. Um, for example, transmission outside schools um, in the first uh, piece of work and um, additional controls control measures in the second. So um, I just want to thank my co-authors, uh, of which there are many. Um, Department for Education for providing the school data, COMIX survey team, and also um, some Juniper colleagues who were really helpful with the contact um, work uh, in March. Great, thank you very much, James. Um, I'll give you a virtual clap as uh, we're not in, in, in the INO itself. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, while people are uh, thinking of questions to put in the chat. We've probably, we've got a few minutes if people want to ask any quick questions. Um, I had a quick question. It's a slightly, um, it, it, it's about sort of how you implement uh, the impacts of school closures in for lockdown one and lockdown three. And apologies if, I, if you mentioned it and I didn't understand, but because um, obviously, although schools were closed, they remained open 